Hey there, everybody, and welcome to Real Time, where we are live talking about film and television and everything in between. Today's guest, I'm very excited that she has graciously taken the time to join us, a writer from Hollywood. We are going to be having Miss Sahar Jahani joining us and talking about her journey to becoming a writer in the industry. So let's dive right into it. Hey there, everybody. Mustafa Talib here with Cinema King Productions, and thank you all so, so much for tuning in on Real Time. Like I said, today's guest is Sahar Jahani, who is a writer for many popular shows, and I'm very excited that she has taken the time to join us. So without further ado, ladies and, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Sahar Jahani. You are on. Wow, there's a whole clap track and everything yes, thanks thanks yeah. for having me i appreciate it thank you so so much how you been good good you know um we're in california so we're still on lockdown yes um, everybody should be <laughs> yeah i don't well you're in texas right and you guys are yeah. like going we, to the we, mall and stuff <laughs> yeah we started opening up even though i don't 100 percent agree with it but uh yeah, we're, we're making the best of it. It looks, you know, absolutely gorgeous in terms of your weather right now. I can tell there's the yes. sunshine coming through. Right now it's gloomy and cloudy on our end. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. So let's just dive right into it, shall we? Okay. Uh, sure. Could you just quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, I mean, you did a great job uh, already, but I, I'll, I'll do it again. Um, my name is Sahar Jahani, and I'm a writer in Hollywood. Uh, no, I write for film and television. Um, I wrote on a show called Rami, season yes. one. Uh, I think all Muslims know about it. Um, and then I wrote on a few other things, uh, like 13 Reasons Why, the last season, um i'm currently on another netflix show um mm -hmm. yeah and i wrote a movie for amy pascal that has not been you know released or produced yet but you know hoping that it will be and it's sort of like a pride and prejudice love story uh with That's two amazing. muslim characters so yeah it's been quite a journey um and before that I worked at a bunch of other places we can talk about it, but sure yeah. sure so I guess uh, my first real question is what inspired you to becoming a uh, screenwriter um, I think I don't think I ever thought I was gonna be a screenwriter to be honest I, I mm -hmm. adore film and television I think like a lot of young people but I don't think you ever grow up thinking like this can be a job or a career especially in our cultures sure. um, and, you know, I think because we don't really have any examples of people who've done this before, or not that many at least, I don't think it was a, in the realm of possibility. But I definitely mm -hmm. knew I was going to be a writer. I wanted to do journalism. That, that was my major in college. Okay. Um, and that was the only like type of thing I could conceive of doing in, in a creative field. Uh, yeah. I think journalists are just like a little bit more respectable. So, um, but but quickly, you know, going to college, I realized uh, journalism is very, very quickly changing. This was like 2009, mm -hmm. 2010. Um, mm -hmm. And then film was sort of booming and digital content was booming and YouTube was booming. So um, I, I just found myself naturally transitioning to film because that was the more creative way to tell stories. So absolutely. Um, and even when I was doing film I was like I don't even know if I'm going to be a screenwriter like I I thought mm -hmm. I was going to produce because I'm pretty like logistics oriented and I was producing mm -hmm. you know at the time and I was like this is this is fine I'll just produce forever um mm -hmm. but I think slowly the thing that you really want to do will will come eat at you <laughs> and yeah. you you have to kind of take the take the the heed the warning and like just go with it so um mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the inspiration was always inside of me. I always knew I was a storyteller. I just didn't think I mm -hmm. could make a career out of it. Well, I mean, 
you you have and i think you're doing so very well for yourself and you know i think you are a great inspiration for young people who want to get into the field and not be terrified about you know what do my parents think what are my friends gonna say and things like that so i think you are paving the way and i think that's you know very uh courageous and brave of you to to do that um, well thank you hopefully so far knock on wood nothing inshallah, happens yeah. inshallah <laughs> um, yeah so i always feel like everything's gonna like go away like like one day i'll wake up and just not have a job but uh, i'm trying no. not to think about that yeah 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 inshallah i mean i think uh, with your style and and with your uh with every project that you do it will you know always elevate you uh so that you know, you have job security, and you know, and you, and you build your Thank reputation. You. Thanks, thanks. Uh, I appreciate it. So, how and when did you discover your voice in writing? Oh man, I think voice always is evolving for me personally, mm-hmm. um, because every stage of my life has felt very different than the other. Like, I think every two years, I like discover something new. Every year, every year, I discover something new about myself, about my family, my community, like something that I want to talk about that feels very different from the previous year. But Mm -hmm. I think tonally, like the stuff I enjoy writing and the stuff that I found myself uh, being good at writing is very like just poppy and fun and comedic with elements of like emotional drama. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's just like what I enjoy watching is is what I enjoy writing. So like Mm -hmm. I love – like heartfelt comedies. Um, yeah. I, 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 this is not popular opinion, but like, I like Mindy Kaling. <laughs> I think she's funny. <laughs> and she I is like, funny. I like her poppiness and I like the color in her world. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was in, I think my, my voice comes from people that I'm also inspired by. So, uh, right, while, and, and while your group I, of friends are that you surround yourself with as well. Yeah. Yeah. Friends, family, things that I'm watching, things that I'm reading, like it's all influential. Um, mm-hmm. But I think when I first made my short film, that's when I was like, oh, this is like totally me because every I was the writer, I was the director. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to choose every single um, thing that you see on screen and every single choice that was made was my choice. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't even know if I like my voice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and no, but I, I, do, I do obviously. And that really helps me hone in the other stuff that I, I want to write. So I, I, I definitely felt like that was a moment where I was like, Oh, this is, this is what like a film by me looks like yeah. um, or a piece of content. So for sure. So like, uh, I mean, it kind of applies to any creative outlet. You want to create the content that you want to see or you want to experience. Right. So be it, you know, a film, short film, uh, uh, a writing, uh, a novel or whatever, it's whatever your outlet is. You always want to create what you want to watch and you hopefully you pray that others who are like-minded yeah. would enjoy it too. And I yeah, think, you know, you very much uh, exemplified that. That's the best way to put it. I, even in, you know, even for TV, like when people are like, what should I write? I'm like, whatever you want to write. Like you should mm-hmm. never think that I, I'm going to sell something. Like that's never the goal. The goal right. should be like, this is a story I'm dying to tell and mm-hmm. I have to tell it or else I will literally, you know, die but uh and and i won't be able to live if i don't tell the story so like that's the kind of approach i take i never write anything that i'm not passionate about because then yeah. people can tell like people will for sure know they did they'll not notice. care yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. i mean in, in my line of work you know doing films and stuff um like especially like for a portion of my life i was doing freelancing and there are a lot of times i would do the projects just for the sake of, you know, making ends meet financially. But I did not give my 100% because I was not so involved. I didn't care as much for the project. And so I was very, you know, over time I was becoming more and more selective because I knew if I was involved with this, because I care about the project, you know, if it was a nonprofit looking for, you know, to do a commercial or something, then definitely, you know, I would be more uh, emotionally involved uh, in that capacity. So definitely, I, I know what you're talking about, about putting uh, the, 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 the blood and sweat and tears and something that you care about into your creativity. Yeah, yeah, t- definitely. And, and uh, doing projects to make ends meet is, is never a bad thing. So I, I, I feel you on that. Yeah, point yeah, for, for sure. sure. Yeah. Um, so 
what uh, challenges have you faced on your journey? You know, you, you said you, your background is in journalism. So how did you get into, I guess, media or, or rather creative media? Yeah. Um, so the, the, I think trajectories are really important. So I always talk about this. Um, and mm-hmm. people who hear, heard me talk about my journey are, are like, just please stop talking. Um, <laughs> no, but I, yeah, I never really did journalism professionally. I just, I have a degree in it, but, um, I double majored in film again, just because I wanted to diversify my skills and knowing mm-hmm. like film would help me with journalism. That was kind of the goal. Yeah. Um, but I, I really quickly was like, I'm in Hollywood. I go, to, I live here. I go to school here. Like I should maybe try to infiltrate <laughs> this industry yeah. and just see what happens. And so few people have the opportunity to be in LA and I had the very fortunate opportunity of being here. So Um, Mm -hmm. I never take that for granted. I never, I always thank my parents. I'm like, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason why they moved here. (laughs) Uh, but for some reason they did. And, and, uh, you know, I'm grateful for that. So, um, the way I got into film, I did a bunch of internships. I just literally applied Mm -hmm. to everything. Every summer I did pretty bad internships. Like one (laughs) summer I was a PA on a film set and I I think I told the story many times, but my job was to reset like this food scene. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the actor was supposed to like spill a bag of chips. And for some reason the production company didn't want to buy like multiple bags of chips. So I would just brush the chips off the floor into like a bin and then put it back in the bag. And the the actor kept doing it. And there was like six, seven takes. And the chips were dirty at that point. Like this was on the streets. It wasn't even like in a a film studio, right? Right. So that was pretty... pretty uh humbling experience sorry if you can hear the sirens i'm in no, the it's city a, you're in la so I'm you know, in LA, this, yeah. is ex- this is expected uh, not, not a problem <laughs> yeah so that was humbling and then slowly every year i like got a better internship uh one year i worked at a commercial production company the mm-hmm. next year i worked at cbs films so that was like a studio and i was like okay i've made it like i'm at a yeah. real film studio um right. and then the year after i worked at paramount which was like the biggest thing in my in my book um and i think just with every opportunity you can add something to your resume and then people are like you know more interested in working with you but after Mm -hmm. college i took the first job i could find i I really didn't think i was again i didn't think i was going to be a writer and no one really tells you how to do any of this like no one tells you like oh to be a writer you should probably like try to get a job in a writer's room or be yeah. a showrunner's assistant or a PA in a writer's room. Like that's just, I didn't even know that existed. Mm-hmm. Um, so There's no, I, like, no formal like protocol of, okay, right when out of, right out of college and I want to get a job, where do I go and how do I go about it? None of that is like established. Exactly. Right? Well, and there's just so many different paths. Like I think most people mm-hmm. consider production the path, um, mm-hmm. especially at my school. I went to UC Irvine and it's part of like the UC system and I think right. similar to like Texas, right? Um, they just didn't really have a sense of like how development worked and how writing worked. We were mm-hmm. a very production heavy, theory heavy program. So people right. either like went into production or they were going to become professors. Like it, it just, there was nothing in between. Mm-hmm. So I did a lot of production and that's how I got into um, working at YouTube Space LA, which is a flagship nice. facility uh, for YouTubers to come and create content. I think we're on YouTube right now, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> we are. Yeah. yeah. So uh, very familiar with the live stream platform stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. And I worked there as a production coordinator for two years. And my job was basically to help YouTubers make content. Like we, mm-hmm. you know, we set up their gear and we set up their space and we book rooms and you know just making sure things were run smoothly which is like what a producer does um and that was very interesting I think I was really um new to the whole like digital content space so Mm -hmm. um I didn't know who PewDiePie was I didn't know who Lily Singh was or um, I think I met Yusuf Iraqets a few times mm-hmm. uh, at the space too. Just like, you know, big, big names. 
uh, in that in that world. And that was yeah. interesting. But I knew very quickly that I wanted to get into the traditional media space. I was like, this is not the type of storytelling like I want to do. And yeah. You know, I had gone to school for this and I was like making, you know, videos for YouTubers. <laughs> like it was just yeah. we were all everyone who worked there had gone to film school, like had dreams of becoming a filmmaker. So it was kind of yeah. um, heart wrenching to, to do what we were doing. Um, so but thankfully, they started something called YouTube Originals, which is like the Netflix right. of YouTube. And, yes. you know, YouTube Red is still existing and going um so i jumped on board there and that's when i really got into tv making um tv Mm -hmm. business so i was a script not script coordinator i was a i was a scripted coordinator scripted development coordinator which basically means like i would read all the submissions that would come through to our network we were a network Mm -hmm. um i would make grids and graphs of all of our projects keep track of things i was basically the assistant who like just handled every every content every piece of thing that came through i was Mm -hmm. managing that and and what that did and it was really helpful was I was reading other people's scripts and Mm -hmm. knowing like, okay, this is immediately a a terrible script. Um, And that skill is like really important to learn. I think a lot of people don't want to do coverage because they're like, you know, that's like a assistant job or whatever. But I think being an assistant is like the most important thing you could probably do um, Mm -hmm. because, because Hollywood is sort of a hierarchy of a profession, right? Like it's like an apprenticeship, like, it's not stuff you can learn in school, really. You have to do it and you have to find someone who's willing to teach you. So mm-hmm. thankfully at YouTube Originals, I had really good um, bosses who were all in TV for many, many years and in comedy specifically. Um, mm-hmm. My boss worked at ABC uh, for a long time and he had a hand in uh, putting Blackish on air, which was like, you know, it, it was important to me to grow under that umbrella absolutely Um, you need to have the right mentors so they can guide you you know on your path on your journey yeah but that's where i really discovered this idea of like oh you can be a writer and you can write for television and Mm -hmm. you can maybe like have a career out of this and on top of that um they really were like we need diversity that we we keep seeing the same writers the same kind of stories mm-hmm. and at the time Issa Rae was like sort of this big name and she still is um mm-hmm. she's even bigger now and everyone was like we need the next insecure we need the next you know Atlanta like this is this was yeah. the the concept so i was just like you know, I, I don't know any Muslim women who are doing this. I felt Absolutely. like very strongly about um, trying to like tell my story. So mm-hmm. I, while I was working, I ended up getting an MFA in screenwriting. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think you have to get an MFA. I just, that was the thing that really helped me just start doing it and giving me deadlines. And um, it helps me have structure for my writing. I think a lot of people just can... Re- Real yeah. quick, what does MFA stand for? Oh, a master's of fine arts in screenwriting. Gotcha. So okay. I got a master's in screenwriting um, from Stevens College, which is an all women's college. And oh. the program was all women. So that was really exciting. And at the same time, I was working still at YouTube. So mm-hmm. I, I didn't tell anyone for the longest time that I was getting a master's because wow. <laughs> I didn't want them to think like I wasn't taking my job seriously. So yeah. I was just working all day, writing all night sometimes till two or three in the morning and then going to work again. And I did that for two years um, Mm -hmm. until I had, you know, some samples under my belt. And that's really what you need as a writer is you need samples that show your shows your work. You need a portfolio, you need a demo reel. Yeah, all of it. All of it. Exactly. So I think at that point, this was 2018. I kind of knew about Rami Youssef. Um, sort of peripherally had met him a few times because you know mm-hmm. hollywood and muslims were it's there's five people so yeah. <laughs> we all kind of know each other and yeah. i knew he was getting his show going and i think actually at some point um he let me read the script for the pilot which was interesting too and he you know he was like are you interested and you know in what capacity would you want to work here so i i was like i'd love to be in the writer's room and um because I had worked at YouTube with so many people, 
um, I knew all the agents in Hollywood. Like I, that was my job was to get materials from agents mm -hmm. and, you know, read them. So yeah. I contacted my good friend who is now my agent, Danny Alexander. And he, um, read my script and I was like, Danny, I want to go f up for this Rami job. Like, will you represent me? I will, I will, I would no I'll never do this again. Like I'll never ask you for a favor, but this yeah. is like the favor that I'm asking for. Cause I feel like you really just have one favor in you <laughs> from every yeah. person. Um, so he was, he was like, yeah, this is, this is good. Like he really believed in my writing and he submitted me to, and, and, and you know, for a show, you kind of have to go at it from all angles and, mm -hmm really try to um, get people's attention. It's because there's so many writers, everyone's trying to get the same jobs. So, Different ideas, they all wanna have theirs heard. Yeah, so it's nice to have reps on your side who can kind of get you in the door. Um, and yeah, so he, he got me an interview. I interv interviewed with Rami and the showrunner at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I, I got a job as a writer's assistant, which basically is a person who is in the writer's room and they take all the notes. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't get a writing job, but I will say that, you know, it's really hard to get a staff writing job. You, that's like kind of impossible. So uh, right. I was like, I'll do anything. I don't care. I'll just be, I always want to be in the room. So yeah. I basically left YouTube on a Friday and started that job on a Monday, which was really jarring because everyone at YouTube was like, we didn't even know you wanted to be a writer. Um, yeah. So that was interesting. But um, yeah, I I was in the writer's room for season one. I mm -hmm. got a script. Um, I got episode five, which was nice. Uh, nice. That's the Ramadan episode that everyone keeps. They keep sending me memes this month of like that episode, <laughs> which is exciting. Um, yeah. And that was an interesting experience. I mean, we can we can talk more about that. But um you know, I, I did, I did the work and, and, uh, went to New York to shoot with them. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I was also the, I was the writer's assistant and the script coordinator, which is a whole other job. It's like tracking mm -hmm. all the revisions on the script and, you know, production right. drafts and, um, helping the crew, like understand like which script is what, and you know, where are we now? And it's a, yeah. It's a technical task. It's very, very seems um, very jarring. It is. It's and it's very scary because if you make one mistake on revisions, everyone's yep. confused. Like a crew of a hundred people is like, what are we doing? Right. Um, so definitely, people were very generous with me, though. I have to say, like the producers were so nice. Everyone was like, you know, don't worry. Like I think I made a few mistakes, and people were like, don't worry. Like it's your first mm -hmm. time. Um, and you know, by the end of it, the AD and I, the assistant director who, you know, that's the person that's like making the schedule based off of your scripts. Right. Um, they, you want to be good friends with them. So I think at the end of the day, we were, we were good friends. So all of that was really helpful. And then New York was a whole other beast, uh, just living there and being there was interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then that show ended. I came back to LA. I had a, I had an agent at that time, or I still do. And, you know, you, you start the process of trying to get on another show. And that's yeah. continuously the journey of being a writer is like trying to get the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, because our show, our, our writer's rooms are so limited. They're like 10 weeks, 14 weeks, 20 weeks sometimes. That's mm -hmm. it. And then you have to find another job. So it's, it's sort of, um, it's a, it's a real pressure cooker of like, Okay, what's the next thing? Um, so I got it. I got into a few. So in between all of this, I was also like applying for fellowships and grants, and mm -hmm. um, you know, just trying to make stuff on my own too. Which is how you how you saw the film uh, just yeah. one night. That was through the Film Independent Project Involved program. Um, mm -hmm. So I was doing that while I was on the in the writers' room for Rami. Um, and that was an amazing experience. That was um, sort of like a nine-month program where they partner you with uh, a director, a writer, a producer, DP, um, and an editor, and you make a short film in a period of however many months. Um, but Beautiful. it was like film school. It was like it was exactly like what I imagined film school would be like. Um, mm -hmm. And I was supposed to just write, but what happened was my director was British and he, mm -hmm. his visa expired. So he had to go back to the UK mm -hmm. and they were just like, do you want to direct your own film? Which was really 
exciting and scary at the same time. Of course. Um, there's a lot of pressure, but I'm glad I did it, of course. Like, I, I, I want to direct in the future, and this was, like, a great first um, opportunity to do that, and I learned – so much i learned a lot absolutely um, and and for those who haven't watched it i did link it down below in the description so whenever uh we're done with the show or have it open on a second tab uh have uh, take a look at it and it's very well done a very strong story great direction uh the imagery everything was just so so amazing so uh if y'all haven't checked it out definitely uh watch it and uh leave a comment about it uh and while i'm I guess getting a, a minute in, if y'all have any questions for myself or for Sahar in terms of writing or filmmaking, make sure you leave them in the comments down below and I'm gonna be looking over and uh, trying to address them as we are doing this live stream. Continue on. Sure. I don't even know how many people are watching. I can't even see anything. Um, they have a good number. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I, I did that film. It, it went up to a bunch of film festivals around the world. In fact, that's how I met you, right? I, I didn't meet you, actually. I met your wife right. <laughs> at a film festival at, in Lone Star. So Lone Star is in San Antonio? No, where is it? Uh, yeah. It's in Dallas. Dallas, yeah. What am I saying? It's in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. Uh, that's how much I know about Texas. Um, good. And that was the first time I went to Texas, and and I met a bunch of young Muslim women who had come to see the short, which was really really nice. And I met your wife there. Right. So the, the story of how that so how that happened. I mean, I'm I'm so glad it happened because then that way we connected, and you know, I could have you and and you know talk about your journey uh so she told me that a friend of hers invited her to go see the screening of you know these short films and uh then she met you there after watching mm -hmm. your film um and she enjoyed it and then uh she was very gracious you know to mention me and you know my profession and then uh we just you know exchanged emails and then here we are yeah, so i was yeah. it was just it was just destiny and i think that's that in itself is just you know awesome yeah i think wives are wives are amazing right uh, yes also also <laughs> yeah. while we're talking about my wife i yes. have to say she is my creative consultant for this show um <laughs> so any any uh improvements that you've seen has always gone through her and then on top of that today's episode i could not for the life of me come up with a title and i always thinking like you know maybe writing the wrongs or something like that like i was trying to be creative at that but then yeah. i immediately approached her about this and then she said do the right thing but you know mm -hmm. the word right right and i was yes. like that like, is and it just blew me away i was like love the puns yeah, yeah absolutely exactly. and so she's, she's awesome yeah she is an english lit you know uh major and so you know she yeah. has that creativity that uh spontaneity and and that quick wit so yeah. thank you honey for doing that <laughs> really appreciate yeah she's it. awesome i mean yeah we we all instantly bonded and that was great um yeah, I mean, just to kind of wrap up this story, uh, yeah. basically, yes, yeah, so I came back from New York. I was I, I had applied up to a bunch of programs, which you can do as like diversity programs uh, in L.A. Like every studio has their own writing program. So I had mm -hmm. gotten the I had gotten into the Warner Brothers television writing program. And oh, wow. yeah, it's 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 really like prestigious. And, you know, I think over like. 1200 people apply every year or more actually um overall wow. but in comedy there's 1200 applicants and i was one of two that they picked which was it's really flattering right it's like really amazing mm -hmm. but um i think so so you have to be cautious with these programs like sometimes they're awesome and they can get you to the next thing that you want to do but sometimes they can be very limiting right so mm -hmm. at that point you know i had i had done rami i had I had an agent, like I was getting meetings and basically Warner Brothers was like, stop meeting with people. We want you to be here and in the program and only doing the program, which we wow. won't we won't pay you for uh, for six months. And mm -hmm. anything you write in the program belongs to Warner Brothers. Of so course. you, you kind of have to read like the fine print of these things and yes. uh, just know like whatever, do whatever is right for you, right? So mm -hmm. with a heavy heart uh, that year, it was, I remember this was Christmas day. I had to basically step out of the program and I had to like mm -hmm. tell them that I'm leaving. And um, that was really, really tough because I had never said no to anything. And I always yeah. say yes. And sometimes that's detrimental, right? So I mean, 
it has to be a balance. Like, you know, if you're given an opportunity, yeah. you know, don't just pass it up. But at the same time, like if it is going to be conflicting your future plans or, or you know, the, the path that you want to take, well, of course, you want to take that chance. Like, you know, maybe this opportunity is going to be, you know, pushing me way more forward than what I'm currently doing. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, you have to pick your battles kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And just know what's what what do what's right for you. Like just do whatever mm -hmm. you think is best. So um I left and then I got a job on a show for MTV called Undressed, uh nice. which is a reboot. It was supposed to be a reboot of the early 2000s series uh and nobody watches this show but mm -hmm. I, well some people do it was revolutionary at the time because it was it was talking about controversial stuff and it was mtv mm -hmm. right so people would stay up late at night and, and watch the show but it was supposed to be educational for young people about love mm -hmm. sex and romance and all those things so we were trying to reboot that um but it didn't go anywhere uh so i left that show and then and, and not because we weren't good writers but because mtv's scripted development team like just dissolved and they don't do I scripted see. content anymore so yeah. then that's that's when i got on to 13 reasons why um season four the last season right. which is coming out june 5th uh, yes. please watch it uh, yes of course i mean everybody yeah. like i don't think y'all understand who i'm interviewing right now she's worked on a oh. emmy award-winning show rami right it was it was uh, there golden, Glo golden, golden Globe. Globe. <laughs> sorry 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 <laughs> I wasn't yeah. sure, but yeah, Golden Globe winner show Rami. So, you know, we have a high caliber person with us. And then on top of that, she's worked on 13 Reasons Why, which is a hit show. To be honest, I haven't watched it, but it's okay. It's okay. I, I, I know it is highly popular and, you know, I've seen some visual effects, you know, because that also interests me and, you know, I see how, how they do it and it's just, it's fascinating. So, Thank you again so much for, for taking the time. I know you're such a oh, high caliber no, it's, person. It's honestly, I'm not. I'm really not. If you knew like my level in Hollywood, I'm, I'm nothing. Uh, no, it's it. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's very kind. But but yeah, I mean, we it, 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 it 13 Reasons is an amazing popular show and it's so mm -hmm. different from everything else I had done before and um, to this day have done. So it felt like a huge, massive responsibility to um, you know, like get the story right because so many mm -hmm. young people watch that show and they're affected by it. And, you know, there's a whole thing about the suicide that people um, really just like honed in on that one thing about the show, which is so, yeah. um, I think, so detrimental because the, sh the season one is actually about a young girl who was sexually assaulted and mm -hmm. everyone forgets that she was sexually assaulted. They just go straight to her um, suicide scene and, and, you know, it's become this big controversial thing. Uh, right. And actually when I was in the writer's room last year, our showrunner had to decide, you know, whether he was going to take down that scene in season one wow. uh, of her actually killing herself um, because mm -hmm. so many parents and not parents, just like media outlets had like written about it and, um, mm -hmm. There was so much hype about that scene. And to the writers, I think it was very important. Again, I wasn't in the room, but from what I understand of season one is that they really wanted to show how scary suicide was and how mm -hmm. violent it is. And it's not this easy thing that you just take pills and like fall asleep. Like if you're going to kill yourself, like it's really, really tough to watch. And we the and psychological... They, uh, warfare that you have with yourself yeah yeah and it's not like fun it's not no. easy so to just to i think in hollywood you know so often suicide is just like downplayed. take a sleeping pill yeah downplayed and they don't want to go go there but i think what the show did that was really crazy was like they went there and mm -hmm. and people couldn't handle it so they for various reasons you know they ended up taking down the um that scene, which I think is just mm -hmm. sad because it was such a beautifully shot scene too. And right. um, yeah, anyways, a uh, long story, but I felt like I really had a big responsibility being in this writer's room to like pitch Absolutely. stuff that really affects young people and teenagers and like just going into the mental headspace of like, what does it mean to be a young person in America right now that's dealing with like 
uh, we're dealing with shooters, active shooter drills. We're dealing with gun violence. They're dealing with SATs, all these different, like pressures. all these different pressures. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we try to capture that, and it's also like their senior year, so the students, the, the characters, you know, they're going through all mm-hmm. the stuff that like anyone else would go through, but mm-hmm. with an added layer of uh, mystery and murder um, yeah. and all those things so so it was a really exciting and I got to go to set a few times and it was just mm-hmm. like a different caliber of a show I mean the, the budget on that show is insane and it's of Netflix course. so it was just right. fun to like work on something that people um, really really watch mm-hmm. um, and to be a part of that so I really appreciate you know having that opportunity uh, I'm sure it's very rewarding you know just not not just in the uh, I mean the financial part of it but you know just the credibility of it and and the experience of it is just so rewarding and it's almost priceless you know to yeah. have that yeah i mean yeah i think so i think it's definitely priceless but uh also pays well <laughs> yeah. um yeah so no it, it was it was really cool i ended uh the show ended in like december or january so mm-hmm. i i've been developing since then and and again got onto a new show with with actually the same showrunner as 13 reasons so he's doing mm-hmm. something new for netflix um which I can't really talk about, but it's it'll be exciting. But yeah, I mean, I I have my own stuff that I really want to do. I I've pitched a few shows around town uh, mm-hmm. in terms of getting like producers interested, and yeah, there's just like a lot of interest. There's a lot of interest in. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. No, <laughs> it's fine. And it's We're Ramadan. fasting. It's almost, uh, it's almost I over. Had my coffee. I haven't had my yeah. coffee. Um, yeah, and. This is the problem. Like, if this is like me in the writer's room, I'm like, I'm trying to keep myself, you know, alert. Yeah. Um, no, even as I'm talking, I'm like, how does this even come out? But <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, in the future, you know, I'm just trying to build on what I'm doing now and and trying to make content and make movies and shows and stuff. So everything's moving, you know, but, but then the pandemic happened and, right. um, I'm very fortunate to be a writer because I think that's mm-hmm. one of the few things that you can do right now. Absolutely. Um, unfortunately production is shut down and lots mm-hmm. of things are shut down. So I'm very grateful to even be writing at this point. So that is yeah. so awesome. Um, just yeah. a couple of extra questions. I mean, you did hit sure. some of, you know, what I was going to ask, but, um, how do you quickly, just quickly, how do you overcome writer's block if you ever encountered it? Um, definitely, always. I'm always in a constant state of writer's block. Um, I think that you just have to start doing something, right? Like if you're looking at a blank blank page, um, mm-hmm. you have to do what I call the vomit draft. Like you just have to spill out whatever yeah. you're trying to say. Even if it makes no sense, just get it out because it's really hard to look at a blank page, right? It's very difficult. Yeah. And at least if there's words on it, you can like finagle the words and work on that. But if there's nothing on your page, then there's nothing, right? So yeah. I always say like, even even if you don't even know what you're saying, even if it's garbage, just, mm-hmm. just write it out and then you can go back and fix everything because writing is all about rewriting. Um, there's no such thing as a perfect first draft. Anyone who says that is insane and I don't know anyone even the greats you know like Scorsese and Tarantino and whoever you believe in like they I'm sure they they've never had a perfect first draft right so that just doesn't exist and I think this idea of perfection can really be detrimental to writers Mm because nothing is ever perfect and uh the final product of what you see on screen is actually a culmination of like so many people's work. It's not just Mm -hmm. the writing. It's not just the directing. It's like everyone and the entire crew coming together and putting it together. So the thing that you think is perfect on screen is not actually like the direction or the writing. It's everything else in the world. Right. Um, A huge, huge collaboration. It's a huge collaboration. Exactly. But, but it all starts from the page. Like it all starts from the story. So for sure you want to, yeah, for sure you want to put your best foot forward and, you know, um, make sure that the the story is is solid. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I, I think that pressure is the thing that most writers feel. Uh, mm-hmm. when they're getting writer's block and it's because 
maybe they've written something that was really good before and they have to reproduce right. that again and yeah. constantly keep making stuff and constantly doing that. And that can be really draining. And, and at some point you're like, I don't even have any stories to tell, like anymore. Yeah. Like, I'm what bored. am I going to write about? But, um, I think that's where like you have to find inspiration in, 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 in other ways. Um, and just not only write about your life, right? Like the point of mm -hmm. writing is that you can create other worlds and, yeah, I think that's really important. I think I, at first I was like, only you can only write from a space that you you understand. Like mm -hmm. only Muslims can write about Muslims, and I don't think that's true. I think it's better, but I don't think it's yeah. necessarily accurate. I think you have to be able to embody other characters and other worlds. So. so, so we do have a question in regards to that a little bit mm -hmm. uh, from a fellow filmmaker friend of mine who actually I interviewed okay. earlier this week. Uh, his name is Fozi Yahya, great okay. uh, filmmaker. Um, and he asks, how do you decide what to work on as a Muslim, keeping in mind that we can't be involved with certain content that goes against the teachings of Islam? Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, of course, I want to work on stuff that like morally and in terms of values I believe mm -hmm. in. Um, but sometimes you're not going to get that. Like sometimes right. you are in a writer's room where you didn't know the show was going to go a certain direction right mm -hmm. and i don't know i i think it's very tough to be like oh as a muslim i can't do this you know i can't like because because being a writer you you've committed to being in a space that's open and tolerant and mm -hmm. respectful and um again no one wants to work with someone who's like i'm gonna walk out every time we talk about something that's like hot um, you know, like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't uh, approach writing as as a Muslim, to be honest, like I approach mm. writing from a character perspective, uh, because yeah. because the characters are not necessarily me. And um, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to write stuff that is uh, Islamically like appropriate. I mean, mm -hmm. we can debate about what Rami is, right? And, and the stuff right. that the character does. And is that Islamic is it not? I mean, of course, he's he's committing like fiqh according to our fiqh sins, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is that um, characters are human and they come they're they're fallible <laughs> and yeah. they make mistakes. And to to write stuff that's like um, only going to that. be yeah, demonstrating that is important. I think people learn from characters on TV. They also mm -hmm. don't learn, and it's just entertaining sometimes. Like. I think, you know, is, is Game of Thrones, like, is that teaching us anything about, like, no. morality? <laughs> I mean, sometimes, like, it teaches us about power and what power can do. So I think, yeah. I think every show has a theme, and the themes are usually um, along the lines of, like, humanity, right? But they're not, mm -hmm. sometimes they're not Islamic themes, but that's, that's the world we live in. And yeah. I really, I really don't approach stuff in that way. Um, and that might be hard for people to understand, but mm -hmm. um, I think like I think it's going to be a very very hard world in a difficult space if if you if you approach stuff from like a Muslim writer perspective. But mm -hmm. of course, I'm not going to take on a project that I feel is absolutely detrimental to like people. Um, of course, I, I never do. Uh, I, I've been approached to do like CIA stuff and I never do that. I don't, I don't, mm -hmm. I just tell people straight up, like we don't need these stories anymore. Like I think yeah. um, there's a, there's a show. Uh, well, there's a New York, there was a New York times podcast called Caliphate. If you guys remember this and mm. I won't say which production company wanted to make it a, a, a TV show, but there's, Lots of interest in that. And it's about, if, if you guys haven't heard of it, it's about this reporter um, from the New York Times who uh, in, goes into Mosul and, like, she talks about ISIS and the mm -hmm. things that occurs, like, the, the, the way ISIS, like, managed Mosul and, and you know, how they operate. And mm -hmm. her she interviews this young Muslim kid who comes from Syria and he's Canadian and he basically, like, lies about what he's done like he says I, I was like a jihadi fighter and like he says a lot of stuff and basically she realizes he's lying and it's a whole thing mm -hmm. so they th they thought like wow what an amazing story and automatically I was like I was so I was like I will, I'll never do this but if I did do it I actually think that 
the more interesting perspective is the young man's perspective. Like this guy mm-hmm. who goes and joins ISIS, like he was born and raised here in, in the West, like a lot of us. And I think mm-hmm. I thought that was the more interesting um, perspective of like why someone would give up everything to go to a war torn country. And, and, right. and this is a reality. I mean, as, as young Muslims here in the West, I feel like we don't want to talk about this stuff. Like, like, Oh, yeah. that's only like 0.1% of people who would ever do that. But they exist among us, you know, and, and I mm. wonder, I, I was thinking like, oh, maybe it'd be interesting to follow that character, right? Mm. But the, the company was like, no, like, we think the more interesting character is the reporter, this white woman who, mm. again, would come in as like a savior. Um, right. And I was just like, I'm not interested in this. So that was really empowering to be like, I don't think this is important. I think this is actually a white savior story. Like I told them everything I felt and they were like, mm-hmm. okay, like thanks for letting us know <laughs> basically. Right. And and then at the end of the day, I was like, anything I, even if I took on this show, this project, anything I do, it's, it's going to come down to being a story about terrorism. Right. And I just right. don't feel like we need that anymore. We've done a bunch it's of over. shows. We, <laughs> yeah. Homeland exists. You got, y'all can go watch that. Um, mm-hmm. And unless we have a new perspective on like this thing about, you know, you know, I guess extremism, um, mm-hmm. I'm not interested in doing anything related to that. So I think that that is a fine line that I, I will draw because because I think um, so many of these shows like 24 Homeland and Tyrant and all this yeah. stuff was so problematic. Um, but yeah, I think there's a difference between Islamic and problematic, like in, mm-hmm. in the in the in storytelling. So I always try to of course not do things that are problematic i think Mm -hmm. um just trying to be conscious of like representation and and what we're putting out there so um, i think that i mean that that's that's a great answer and i I think it needs to be talked about in in that Mm -hmm. regard and that perspective as well um, yeah. So two last questions, inshallah. Okay. I know this is supposed to be a little bit shorter, but I know you have uh, oh, that's okay. have something else coming up. Um, yeah. So why do you think, and I kind of know the answer, but I just want to hear it from you. Why do you think studios are now accepting stories that are non-traditional, uh, meaning putting the spotlight on quote unquote minority groups, such as like the Muslim community and others? Yeah, I mean, I think studios are interested in just anything that's different um, and that they haven't seen before. So it's not necessarily like Muslim stories. I think they're interested in everything. Um, Mm. But I think Muslim is sort of a buzzword because they've just never seen it before. And of course, I think Rami's show definitely helps. Like the success Mm -hmm. of his show and the critical acclaim of his show really, really helps people feel like oh, there could be another thing that's just equally successful, right? And Mm -hmm. I think, again, Insecure did the same thing for black women. I think Atlanta did the same thing for black men, like, Mm -hmm. and and those communities that we haven't seen before. So it's not just about getting a show on air. It's about getting, I think, a critically acclaimed show um, Mm -hmm. that people are going to, um, you know, give awards to because they think it's, like, so amazing. And, And mind you, like, I know that those critics are, a bunch of white people so so their yeah. standard of like what's amazing is, is going to be different from our standard of amazing mm-hmm. yeah. um and and i know muslims like have many many opinions on rami and the show and and that's mm-hmm. fine um but you have to realize like how freaking difficult it is to get a show on air like yes. literally the challenge i don't know what the percentage is but but i think hundreds and thousands of things get pitched every year and there's only like 500 shows on air. So from mm-hmm. thousands to 500, like who gets, who gets to have that opportunity? So um, mm-hmm. whether you like the show or not, you have to agree that it, it definitely um, broadened paved, the horizons yeah. and paved the way. And, but, but, but we also have to recognize that people of, like minority groups have been doing this work for a long time and mm-hmm. African-American communities and, and, you know, yes. black content has been trying to do this for a long time. So we're we're riding the wave of like a bunch of other minority groups who mm-hmm. are also um, in this it's process. Our turn. Yeah, our yeah, turn. and and by the way, like pressure from audiences, right? Like people mm-hmm. loved 
crazy rich Asians, you know, it, it did well yeah. in the box office and people were like, all right, well, this is commercially successful so we can make something else. Again, it's all about money, by the way. It, it, it isn't, yeah. It's not about diversity at all. Um, yeah. But they're just like, okay, people have an appetite for this content and maybe we've been ignoring like half the population for a long time. So it's a good thing overall. That's, that's great to hear. Um, lastly, how okay. do you handle criticism of your work? <laughs> Not very well. I like pretty much go into a depressive state and <laughs> have to climb my way out of it. Um, I mean, you know, like just one night, the short film, like it's there's a moment in there. I won't give it away. But um, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely like hard to watch and it's controversial and uh, yeah. provocative, I would say. But but I like thoroughly thought about the choice right I didn't just like write it and be like this is it like mm -hmm. I debated the choice I talked to my producers I talked to other Muslim women I uh like even rewrote it multiple times and I was like I'm not gonna do this but um that is that that film is probably the thing that gets the most critique because with Rami like even though I wrote on the show, I can kind of take a step back and be like, it's not my show, right? Uh, right. I, I dissolve. And he's been really great at like just taking the, sh the, the blame and, and the heat for mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. So he doesn't he doesn't ever throw his writers under the bus. Um, so that's good. But yeah. uh, I think I think I, I try to listen to everything. Like I, I definitely don't want to make content in a bubble. Like I'm not making mm -hmm. content just for myself. I'm making it for mainly Muslim women like I care about mm -hmm. I don't really care about Muslim men to be honest like I don't care about their opinion understandable uh, I, <laughs> we get I a bad rap Muslim women I care about women in general I definitely want to watch mm -hmm. um and yeah like that's who I really pay atten attention to which is which is why it was so important and inspiring when your wife and, and a bunch of other women came to the screening because I was like this is my only way of understanding like how people feel about the show and we had a discussion mm -hmm. about it we went to coffee afterwards and yeah. they they all said really nice things but um, I know that uh, a lot of people aren't gonna like everything I make and that's fine mm -hmm. like as a filmmaker you just have to be comfortable with people critiquing your work because that's how you get better um, absolutely and I'm sure like 13, oh my God, 13 Reasons has so many Reddit pages and like oh, people sure. <laughs> like, you know, commenting on the show and teens commenting. So I know like my episode this season will probably be a really, really um, crazy, crazy one, crazy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we get, we get the heat, but you just kind of like uh take take what you need to take from that and and move on i wouldn't try to listen to everyone that's the problem is like people mm -hmm. try to listen to every single critique and i think you have to trust the people you're taking critique from so um mm -hmm. whoever you trust i think is is the most um beneficial person to take critique from absolutely yeah. this has been amazing thank you Sahar, so yeah, so no much problem from taking the time out of your busy day uh, to, to be good. on the show. And uh, we will catch up in just a moment. Thank you so, so much. Okay, thank you for having me, appreciate it. Thanks. All right, guys, so I hope y'all enjoyed this episode of Real Time. If y'all did, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Make sure you hit that post notification down below so you are notified when we go live again here on Real Time, where we talk about film, television, and everything in between. And if y'all would like to sponsor an episode, I don't know who would uh, be listening to this, but if y'all would like to, please hit me up and we can make something happen. We would greatly, greatly appreciate it. This is Mustafa Talib and I will see y'all in the next one. Assalamu alaikum. Peace out.